Are you glad you're in the house today? Are you excited you're here? Are you excited you came? All right. Today is day three of the Harvest Conference 2019. Yes! Hallelujah! Oh, no, we ought to make some noise. Make some noise! We're so excited to be here. We want to get right into the word of God so that we have some ample time to listen to the word. And the speaker for tonight is already in the house. I'm, yeah, it's, yeah, what a joy. Awesome. I met him a, a few years ago. I was still in campus. He's an amazing man of God, all the way from Eternal Life Church in Langata. I want us to rise to our feet, put your hands together, celebrate Jesus as we invite Reverend John Wesley Charlo. Come on, celebrate, 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 celebrate. my son, my firstborn. His name is Wesley Jr. Just wave. Turn around and wave. Say hi, guys. <laughs> I'm excited to be here and I want to appreciate the leadership of this church from the bishop all the way down to all the departmental leaders that made this youth conference possible. Pastor Brian, thank you so much for believing in me yet again. To give me an opportunity to come back to share the word. How is everybody? Mukosawa. Mukosawa. Maze na kani kama atmosphere me shift kanda ivi. I just shift to make a tie in Jesus' name. Can you just keep on playing your montage? Amen. Lift up your hands before this holy God. And just love on him for two seconds. Thank you, Jesus. I just, I know we have been worshiping, but just feel we just need to give him five more seconds or minutes. I don't know. And just love on him tonight. You are Yahweh. 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 Alpha. Yeah, just lift your voice and declare.
Have your way tonight. Be glorified. Through the word, be glorified. Spirit of God, we invite you. Speak to us tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks. Our hearts are ready. Our spirits are ready to hear from you. Speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. I know if you're clapping for Jesus, you can do a better job. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, you can go glory. ahead and lift your voice and magnify him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While you take your seats, turn to your neighbor and tell them, act like it. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you so much, worship team, for lovely voices and anointed worship. God bless you. Turn to your neighbor one more time, tell your neighbor, act like it. I'm just following on the theme of this conference. It's about practical Christianity. Amen. Showing that you have truly encountered Jesus. I want to share a message I, am, I have entitled, Profiting by the Word of God. Profiting by the Word of God. Profiting by the Word of God. And I'd like us to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, 16, and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, 16, and 17. I bring you greetings from my wife. I'm married to one wife of the opposite gender. Um, her name is Hannah Wesley. Amen. And she sent her love tonight. We're traveling to uh, Kitui County tomorrow morning for another conference on that side. So she remained behind to just pack because we'll be there for a few days, but she sends her love. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You will take me back to verse 15, and I'd like us to read it together. Are you ready? 
Just let's read it together. Three, go. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Mm -hmm. What do the Scriptures, uh, uh, what is their ability in verse 15? It says, the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. So I want to share about six things that will come as a result of an encounter with the scriptures. Six, six things that come into your life as a result of an encounter with the word of God. And number one, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, is that the scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. The scriptures are able to make you wise or to make one wise unto salvation. There are many things about our walk with God and our relationship with Jesus that will require us to walk in wisdom. We are born again, but we have not been taken away into a place where there are no temptations, where there are no trials, where there are no difficult times. God chose to allow us to remain here on earth with the drunkards and the prostitutes and the unbelievers and everybody else and the satanists and the devil worshippers and people who have no fear for God. So he says, while you are here on earth, I give you the scriptures that are able to make you wise. While you're here, you need wisdom. Can you tell your neighbor you need wisdom? The Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 130 that the entrance of thy word brings light and brings understanding to the simple. The entrance of thy word. Psalms 119 verse 130 or rather 130. 130 says the entrance of thy word brings what? Light and causes the simple to come to a place of understanding. There is no other way to walk in wisdom here on earth apart from the scriptures. There is no other way. There is no other way. If you require the wisdom of God as far as salvation is concerned, you must become a friend of the word of God. Tell your neighbor for me, become a friend of the word of God. It is not the word that you read that makes you wise. It's not the word that you write down on but, but that makes you wise. Or the word that you hear someone else quote that makes you wise. It is the word that enters into your heart that makes you wise. From the time I was young until now, and I'm not very old by the grace of God. I have come to understand that it is not the counsel or the advice of a man or a mentor or a preacher that will make me live right. It is the scriptures that I choose to invest in my spirit. It is the word that I choose to engage with in my heart that makes me wise unto salvation. Some of the things that I knew were, were wrong for me to do. I did not know them because I was told they were wrong. No, I interacted with the word of God and it taught me wisdom. I challenge someone tonight in the name of Jesus. I know this message may sound simple, but I want you to know it's so foundational to the Christian faith that we must remind ourselves of these matters. Engage the scriptures. Tell your neighbor, the Bible does not discriminate. Say, the word of God does not discriminate. It does not matter how old you are. Amen. It doesn't matter how young you are. When you interact with the word of God in the right way, you will receive unusual wisdom. Hi. Timothy was counted wise. Even though he was young. Because that young man had interacted with scripture. I pray that this generation will return to the place of the word. Not to these other things that we are finding ourselves attracted to in this hour and in this day. I pray that we will understand that until we marry our hearts to the word of God, wisdom shall be lacking in the young generation. This generation is calling itself the millennials, the younger ones, the millennials. 
But the big question is, what is the hope for tomorrow if the millennials do not grab the scriptures and make the scriptures a heart matter? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Nowadays, we are doing what we call TED Talks. We are doing motivational talks. We are doing counseling sessions. That is not the solution for wisdom in salvation. The solution for wisdom in salvation is an encounter with the word of God. Hmm. It says, secondly in verse 16, that all scripture is inspired by God. That means it was not given by the idea of a man. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 and 21, the Bible says that, that we now know that the scriptures were not given by private interpretation. But men, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, wrote and spake the scriptures. It is not a suggestion. The word of God is not a suggestion. This is instruction for life. This is what will make you influence, uh, influential in life. This is what will make you established in life. The word of God. The word of God. The word of God. Amen. <laughs> People have said, look inwards. I say, don't look inwards. Look to Jesus. Amen. Because if you look inwards, what you find in there will depress you. That's why young people are taking their own lives. Because there's nothing in them that is good enough to make them wise unto salvation. Unless you have filled this thing in your heart. David says, I have hidden thy word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Your heart has nothing if it has not anything called the scriptures in it. It has nothing. If you don't have the scriptures in your heart, you have nothing. Tell your neighbor that. So number two, the scriptures bring the profit of doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. Teaching. That word doctrine simply means teaching. Verse 16 says that it is profitable for doctrine. Anything you need to be taught in life is in the Bible. Glory to God. It says it brings profit for reproof. That word reproof is an, English, an old English word which simply meant conviction. Conviction. The other meaning of that word is testing. So the scriptures are able to bring you to a place where you can test the things you're convicted about. Mm. The things that you're convicted about, you can check them and test them when you know the word. You must know the word. It says for correction as well. And for training or instruction in righteousness. What is this righteousness? It is equity of character. Righteousness is right standing before God. Righteousness is being justified before God. That's righteousness. It's only the word of God that will bring you to a place where when God looks at you, he justifies you. Hmm. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 20 and 21. I love what it says in verse 21. I know I just quoted it before. But let me just repeat that. It says that for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of a man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Tell your neighbor this thing, this Bible is not an ordinary book. Say it again. It's not an ordinary book. It's able to teach you. Correct you. Reproof you, instruct you in matters of righteousness. You know, we go to some pastors. Uh, I believe the city of Nairobi should have about 2,000 youth pastors, just approximately. Uh, and young people prefer running to the youth pastors because, you, you know, youth pastors tend to understand young people more than the senior pastors. Why? Because the senior pastors, or me chapa, or me zeka, or me beat. They may not understand life as we see it, right? And so, in critical issues of life, where we are supposed to seek counsel from the word of God, we go to men who we have honored and respected, pastors, 
and they give us counsel. And then we end up with a generation that is confused because every pastor has his own personal interpretation of scripture. Some agree, some do not agree. Very recently, I was listening to a debate about, or just, just watching from a distance, a debate about whether Christians should do secular music, a Christian artist should do secular music. And that debate came as a result because one who was Christian, a Christian artist, and it's not Willie Paul, but, but one, one who was a Christian artist decided, of course Willie Paul is one of them, but I'm not talking about him. But this one came as a shocker because they were not expecting her to do so. She just decided to do secular. And so the youth pastors were having a conversation. Is there anything wrong with that? And they give personal opinions. And what surprised me is that some of them that gave those personal opinions actually approved of what she did. They said, it's just career. It's a career. It's a career that, like, you know, like any other career. The problem with getting philosophical about matters of life that affect your walk with God is that by the time you wake up to the reality that you've walked so far from God, it will be too late. We don't solve life issues using philosophical arguments and logical debates. We solve life issues using the word of God. The Bible has instructions for every matter. It was written many years ago, but I'm telling you it is relevant today 100%. You raise about any issue of debate, current or not current, the scriptures can give you an answer for it. How is it that we are limiting our God? Our God cannot. He cannot give us a script, a book, a gathering, a collection of the word, and then tell you, this one will make you wise to salvation if he was joking about it. No, he wasn't. Any matter can be addressed. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, any matter can be addressed. <laughs> Including how short a dress should be. Come on, talk to your neighbor, talk to your neighbor. Yes, yes. Including whether you should wear your shirt and leave five buttons open. Yeah, it, that, that can also address, this scripture can address it. You know what? Even masturbation can be addressed in the scripture. Some people, oh, there is no direct inference of ma masturbation. You have not read your Bible. You'll be surprised. Just interact with scriptures and you will see some amazing things. Where Paul is instructing the, the Thessalonians and he tells them, look... The way you control your bodies must be in such a way that it glorifies God. <laughs> because God had foreseen, some people would come up with crazy ideas of controlling their sexual desires. Read the scriptures, you will find the answers there. The word of God is to your prophet. Can you tell your neighbor it is to my prophet? Now lift up one right hand like if you're swearing and say, I commit to live by the word. Number three, the scriptures must become experiential in your life. The scriptures must become experiential in your life. First John chapter 1 verse 1. I love that scripture. It's a scripture that I uh, began to read and, and, and you know, look at it slowly and, and study it. And I realized this is a powerful truth. It says in verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. And our hands have handled. When you read that scripture, you be begin to think that it's talking about something that is tangible, isn't it? Because we heard it, we saw it, and we handled it. And then he says, concerning what? So what is the subject? The word of life. Everyone say, the word of life. Say it again, the word of life. The word of God must become tangible to you. You must handle it. You must live an experience of scripture in your life. My God. Everything about you must reflect the effect of the word of God. Let's move away from this uh, intellectual mindsets that we have. Experiencing the word of God in the mind and not in the heart. 
experiencing the word of God as people tell you, but not practically in your life. When we say God provides, you must see him as a provider. If you don't see him as a provider, you have not experienced him. When we say God delivers and he saves you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, then unless it is a reality in your life, you're free to walk away from the Christian faith. Hmm. Yes, I said it. That's how practical I get. If the desire for sex, the desire for drugs, the desire for violence does not come an, into an encounter with the word of God and break that hold over your life, then you can walk away from the faith. Until it is practical, it's not real. Hello? Hello? Don't look at me like that. I'm human like you, yes, and I'm saying it. Until it's practical, it's not worth it. Haven't you been seeing the trends that pastors are quitting the faith? Have you seen the trend? And they're giving all kinds of arguments why they have quit the faith, why they have no longer preach faith, why they no longer teach the grace. And they're walking away from the pulpit and feeling nothing about it because it was never real for them in the first place. My God, you cannot encounter Jesus and walk away from him. You cannot encounter the word and walk away from him. You cannot sing about him and worship him and magnify him and then wake up tomorrow morning and say, I'm tired of singing about him. I want to sing about the environment. I want to sing about love. That is just baloney. Nonsense. It must be experiential. Haskell, have you heard? Have you seen? Have you touched? Have you handled? The word of life. You must go on your knees and seek God every day until it becomes practical. You must search in your heart for him until it is a reality. If they say it happened to Paul, then it must also happen to me. If my father or my friend or someone that I've known in the neighborhood has said that Jesus is real, then I want to feel him and encounter him in the same way because this testimony must be personal. The work of faith must be personal. My father is a preacher. My mother is a preacher, so I'm a pastor's kid. And when I was growing up in the pastor's house, you are forced to live a Christian life. It's not your choice. We were forced to wake up every morning to go and pray. So 5 a.m. would be waking up and we'll go to church. We'll pray for one hour. Then come back home, prepare ourselves and go to school. That was my life. Every day we had evening devotional Bible study. And so we'd sit down and we were forced to read the Bible. To give a devotional message. Not because we felt it. Not because it was practical for us. No. It was routine. And if you dare go against routine, there is a cane for you. Yeah, it was not being suggested. My father was unapologetic. He knew that's the only way I'm going to make this young man and this young girl turn out to be Jesus lovers. And he labored. And for many years, I knew the God of my father, but I did not know my God. For many years, I talked about the God of my father. Because we would come to places where I would really, really sure testify, this was God. This one was God. One time I was sick, I had some strange malaria, and I was having hallucinations. I was young. I was as young as this young man here, Wesley. I was so sick, bedridden, fevers, and headaches, and I was turning around and screaming at night and during the day because I was seeing creatures creeping all over me. And my father was praying and fasting at that particular season. He walked into my room and, and began to pray for me. And I'm turning and I'm, I'm in pain and I'm having this crazy thing happening to me. And as he prayed for me, he laid his hands on me and began to pray in the spirit. And instantly I felt something move in my stomach. And it rolled up and whirled up in my tummy and came up. I literally thought I'm going to spit out or vomit out a snake. Because that's what it felt like inside me. But when he said in Jesus' name, I command the healing or the power of God to heal my son to rest on you now. I plead the blood of Jesus. Something came out of me. I vomited. Instantly, Pastor Brian, I got healed. Now, I knew that was power. 
I knew that was God. I knew it. But it was not personal. It was what my father knew, what he had experienced. Oh, I don't know if I'm communicating. Am I making sense? It must be experiential. My goodness. It must be experiential. One time, we are, we are, you know, the preachers of the old days really went through a lot of struggle. In fact, for the longest time, I told my father and everybody else around me, I will never be a pastor. I mean, long story short, look at where I am today. But, but, but <laughs> the experiences that we went through made me feel like I will not desire to serve God. So one time, we are gathered in the house, there's no food. Our parents have told us there's no food, and we're just going to sit here and wait for God to provide. And they set plates on the table. And we sat there, we had salt. That's all we had, salt. And we sat there, and I remember my dad and mom praying. And they said, Lord, provide. I kid you not. As soon as we said amen, there was a knock at the door. And someone walks in with two bags full of shopping, food. I mean, we're looking at these guys and we're thinking, you guys must be aliens. This is unreal. This is unreal. And so I remember when I began to talk about God and I began to preach to my young uh, friends and, and my age mates, I would tell them about the testimonies and the miracles that happened in the house of my father. But I never knew this God personally until one time I was praying and God told me, you need to know me. You need to know me. You need to stop giving testimonies that have, you know, happened in the life of your father and start telling people about me and what I have done in your life. I had a personal challenge and I said, God, if you will deal with this matter, then I will believe you. I'd struggled with it. From the time I was seven years old, I'd struggled with masturbation. Ten years, fifteen years. I'm in church. I pray. I fast. But this thing is not going away. And I remember telling God, if you will deal with this thing, then I will believe you. And one day, just like that, in an encounter as I was praying, this desire was plucked out of my system. <laughs> Never returned. Then I began to talk about my God. I began to talk about the God I have experienced. Saints, if you don't have experience with the word. If you don't encounter the scriptures enough for it to turn around your life, it is unreal. You will be unbelievable anywhere you go. Nobody will listen to you because you're telling stories. Yet your life is nothing close to what you're talking about. Do you wonder why people don't want to give their lives to Jesus in this era? Do you wonder why we have millennials running away from church? It's because the preachers as sinners on, on the pulpit. The word of God is not real in their lives. They are found in some funny corners and their lives are miserable. Their own wife and, and children cannot testify of the encounter with God. They are only preachers for profit. And so the young generation, when they are growing old, this young boy just turned 13 this year and as he continues to grow, he will come to a place and tell me, Daddy, checkmate. What you've been talking about, it's either real or not. The greatest witness I can be to my son is not talk to him about the scriptures, but live a life that will cause him to see God and desire God for himself. The reason why I'm standing here is because I saw God in my father. I saw God in my mother. Until it is experiential, quit. Hmm. Tell your neighbor until it is experiential, quit. <laughs> Number four. I know you call this revival meeting. We are being revived, amen. <laughs> Tell your neighbor you are being revived in the name of Jesus. The scriptures, number four, the scriptures release the power of God, which our faith 
must rest on. The scriptures release the power of God which our faith must rest on. Hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18. Tell your neighbor the message of the cross is the power of God for everyone that is being saved. Ask your neighbor for me, are you being saved? Are you being saved? Now, from where I come from, uh, and, and from the little theological background I have, I've been told salvation is in three dimensions. I've been told that when you say the sinner's prayer, you are saved. I've also been told that as you continue to renew your mind by the word of God, you're being saved. I've also been told and by the study of scripture that one day you shall be saved from this body of turmoil and pain. So salvation is in three phases. When you said yes to Jesus, you were saved. But your mind still thought some dirty things. Your body still longed for some things that were not right. So what's happening now? You are being saved. Now the power of God to redeem you now and to continue redeeming you now is in the message of the cross. The gospel. The word of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. First for the Jew, then for the Greek. And I love what it says in verse 17. For therein, therein where? In the word of God is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith. Why? Because the just shall live by faith. Where you are today, you need to move from where you are today to another dimension. How do you grow that way? Scripture. For in this place is the righteousness of God revealed. The stuff you knew yesterday is good, but it's not good enough. You need to move from faith to faith. It's called being saved. Huh. So there's no end to this thing. Yes, sir, there is no end to this thing. <laughs> Until Jesus comes back, there's no rest. There's no rest. Preachers who have been preaching for 50 years or maybe people who have been in the walk of faith for 50 years or 30 years or 40 years, they're like, ah, nimeomba kutosha. Nimeenda kesha za kutosha. Wacha niachie vijana. Yeah? The discipline they had to study the scriptures. When I say, ay, ata mungu wanaelewa. Amen. You have to sleep for eight hours at least. It's a folly of thinking that you've outgrown the devil. The strongest man in the scriptures was Samson. He was not stronger than the enemy. The most spiritual man in the scripture was David. He was not more spiritual than the enemy. Or too spiritual for the enemy to put him down. The wisest man in the scripture was Solomon. But he was not so wise enough so that the enemy would not conquer him. All these three men have three common factors. They ended badly. They began in the power of the spirit. Their stories inspire us. David, a psalmist, someone who was so spiritual, the guy would be worshipping and worshipping in the woods and loving on God and a bear would appear and just like that, it's like one hand is worshipping, the other hand is, you know, swinging the sling. He would slay animals by the anointing. How do I know when he stood against Goliath, he said, I have come to you in the name of the Lord. I have not come to you with my own skill. I have come to you in the name of the Lord. 
So he slayed the bears and the lions under the anointing. The guy was spiritual. The guy was mature. That when even though he had been anointed as king. He was not foolish to take the throne from the anointed one's soul. He waited until God brought it to pass. The guy was deep. I mean, some of the Psalms we sing were written by him. How many of you love the Psalms? If, if I was to pick any random Christian today, and every random Christian would say, there's a Psalm which is my favorite. Psalm it's 23, Psalm it's 91, Psalm it's uh, 126, 125, 21. You hear people say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. It's a psalm that David wrote. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He wrote it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. And he will say of the Lord, you are my refuge. and my... He wrote it. But when he saw a woman who was not his wife, he forgot that he was a spiritual man. He had gotten to a place where he was now chilling and resting. The Bible says in the time when kings are supposed to go for war, David remained in the palace. The guy was saying, Ay, Kesha, nini? Vijana. Spiritual warfare, nimeachia nini? Vijana. Hmm. Are we going to rest? No, we will continue. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4 and verse 5 it says that my preaching or my speech to you was not in the eloquence of words or in the words of human wisdom. No. That's, that's not how I came to you. I didn't come to you to give you a motivational speech. No. I didn't come to give you a TED talk. No. I didn't come to tell you my story so that you can feel for me and perhaps come to Jesus through my story. The church has elevated the wrong things. Let me tell you the truth. Everybody has a story. Yours may be more scandalous, but nevertheless, we all have stories. So quit elevating your story and elevate Jesus. Are you hearing? So, <laughs> people have elevated stories and they think that when I stand here and tell young people how I've been raped five times, how I've aborted 20 times, I will somehow convince you that the power of sin that pushes you to abort will leave you. No, it is the word of God and Jesus Christ that will cause you to stop that filthy life. Not my story. My story inspires. It doesn't change. Motivational talks, they motivate. They don't transform. If you listen to a motivational speech and you're a prostitute, you leave the house highly motivated but still a prostitute. Highly motivated but still a thief. Highly motivated but still a drug dealer. Highly motivated but you're still masturbating three, four times a day. My God. We need to bring back the word of God. Take me back to what he said in chapter 2 verse 4. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4. Paul says what? That my, when my speech was not with what? Persuasive words of human wisdom. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? Verse 5. So that your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men. But in the power of God. I highly respect men who have written books about the experiences. And they, they, the intention is good. They want to lead us from the path they walked. Because it almost destroyed their lives. But our faith will not rest on motivational books. Or instructional books. Our faith will rest on the power of God. And where is the power of God? In the message of the cross. Point people to Jesus and they will be delivered. Point people to the cross and their lives will turn around. That was Greek for I love Jesus. Hmm. For as many as have received him, he gave them what? To become what? John chapter 1 verse 12. The last point. Did I say six points? Where am I at? There's something giving me pressure up there. 
It's called a timer. <laughs> well, number five, right? It is by the scriptures that we enter the rest of God. Tell your neighbor there is a place called the rest of God. Now, now help me preach. Tell your neighbor there is a place called the rest of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 and 2 says this. Let us fear lest we miss or we fail to enter the rest of God. For the promise of his rest still remains. Right? And let us, let us watch that we f lest we fall short of entering that rest. Why? It's important that a child of God enters into the rest of God. But why should we fear? I'll give you the reason. In verse 2. Verse 2 he says, For the same message was preached to them as well as to us. Hebrews 4.2. For the same message that you're hearing right now was preached to them. The same gospel that has been preached to us was also preached to them. Hebrews 4.2. But it did not profit them. Everyone say, the message did not profit them. Why? Because they did not mix it with faith. They had it, but they didn't believe it. The same message that had changed the Hebrew church. There are people who had it, but they did not believe it. It was of no value to them. Why? There are many of us, we hear this message that Jesus can change you. The word of God will transform your life, but we don't believe it. We don't mix it with faith. I have dealt with such people, and I've been a pastor of church members that are asking me the same question for the last five years. Lord, uh, pastor, please help me. How do, I, how do I experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Pastor, please help me. How do I stop uh, walking in anger? Pastor, please help me. I said, I cannot help you. Go into the scriptures and the scriptures will help you. Because I have gone into the scriptures and they have changed me. What I do is I direct you to the solution. But you got to get there yourself. Ay, 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 ay. Ay, 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 ay. Because we have thought that when we lay our hands on sinners, they become righteous. No, they just become anointed sinners. They, they, they get to a place where they are doing what they are doing against God, but with an anointing. It's not the laying of hands that changes men. It's an encounter with the word of God that changes men. There's a place called rest, the rest of God, where you rest from your struggle against sin, where you rest from your struggle against the enemy, and you have a settled mindset that God is with me in this life. And no matter what you go through, you're persuaded that God will keep you from falling, that God will preserve you, that God will bring you out victorious that even though you're in the valley you're going through it you're not camping there you're going through it there is a place called the rest of God some theologians argue that it comes after we die well I beg to differ I am a believer of the here and the after the same grace that we will experience after we must have a taste of it now Otherwise, why did Jesus say, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? In heaven? On earth. As it is. Where? So if I cannot have a taste of heaven here on earth, then I don't want to go to heaven. Some of you think that God is a poor marketer. He is not. Have you walked into a place and you want to buy some product and they say, and it's a food, it's a type of food, and they say, you sample this, taste it first. Now, human beings who are just ordinary understand that there's power in persuading someone by giving them a taste of things. How much more God? He says, in this time and season, you can taste of me and know that I am good. Hmm. There is a rest. Tell your neighbor there is a rest that you must enter. But it comes when you mix the word of God with faith. You will not enter the rest of God until you mix the word of God with faith. The last point, and then I'm out of here. 
It is by the scriptures that one encounters prosperity. It is by the scriptures that one encounters prosperity or establishment in life. Now I'm going to quote some scriptures that are familiar to some of you. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But what will you do with it? You shall meditate upon it day and night. So that what? Now before you get to so that, it said doing everything or being careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be what? Prosperous and successful. Psalms chapter 1 verse 1. It says, blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Nor stand in the way of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers so don't walk don't stand don't sit in wrong environments tell your neighbor act like it say it again don't walk don't stand don't sit in wrong environments but what should your delight be verse 2 but his delight shall be upon meditating in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates how many times? Once a year? When you're having the conference? How many times? <laughs> and then he says what in verse 3? You shall be like a tree that is planted by the streams of water. Which yields its fruit in season. And whose leaf does not wither. And whatever you do you shall prosper. What is the answer to poverty? The word of God. Amen. Luke 4, 18, Jesus comes out of the wilderness 40 days after prayer and fasting and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to do what? To preach good news. To the who? To the who? <laughs> You don't help the poor by giving them money. You help the poor by pre preaching the gospel to them. Because when you catch the gospel, you get to prosper. I said when you catch the gospel, you get to prosper. Imagine in that scripture, even deliverance is a message. It's not come out, come out. No, no, no. It's a message. It's a, listen, say. No, don't, don't go out, don't go out. Yes, it says to preach deliverance to the captives. To preach deliverance to the captive. You can do seven deliverance classes and get a certificate of participation and still have demons in you until you encounter the word of God. Kaya. Until you encounter the word of God that is able to kick out some devils out of your system. Some of the devils we are fighting with are altars that were raised by our fathers and their fathers before them. Every African has an altar that is speaking against God in his life. Every African. Don't be so self-righteous. Do you know what your great-great-grandfather was doing? Pasi, do you know? You don't know. He could have been a wizard. <laughs> do you know? <laughs> Pasi, do you know what your father and your father after that and your father was doing? There are altars that are speaking in our past that we must deal with, Africans. Ladies and gentlemen, do you hear me? And those things, you don't deal with them unless you have encountered God. Gideon was told by God, I am sending you. And I will give the Midianites in your hands. But before you do that, there's an altar speaking in your father's house. You must pull it down. He actually went and pulled it down. It's a message. Tell neighbor, it's a message. If you want to prosper in life, you want to be blessed, you want to be established, you want to have money, you want to get a job, you want to have a good wife, a good husband, you want to succeed in life, we, I promise you, it is in the word of God. This is where it is. Tell anybody, true prosperity is in the scriptures. Say it again, true prosperity is in the word. David one time was 
you know, sort of complaining. And he told, he told God, how come these guys are wicked? They don't pray. They don't fast like me. They're not spiritual like me. They don't go to church like me, but they're prospering. I'm seeing them, you know, living in big houses. And he was just murmuring and murmuring and murmuring until he went to the house of God. And as he was murmuring, he took a posture of worship. And God revealed to him the end of the wicked men. And he said, when I saw their end, my complaints stopped. When I say true prosperity, I'm not talking about big houses. I'm not talking about nice cars. Tell anybody those are good. But that's not what pastor is talking about. I'm talking about the prosperity of your soul. I'm talking about the prosperity of your spirit. Which in turn will bring about the prosperity of material things. That is true prosperity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I know today I was I'm not going to teach in mode. Like in this hour, amen. Tell your neighbor, profiting by the word. Say it again, profiting by the word of God. Let's review. Number one, scriptures are able to make one wise unto salvation. Number two, the scriptures bring profit in doctrine, in reproof, in correction, and instruction in righteousness. Number three, the scriptures must become experiential. You must leave them as a lifestyle. Number four, the scriptures release the power of God which our faith must rest on. Number five, the scriptures are the access keys to the rest of God. I don't know if I told you that, but yeah. The scriptures are the access keys to the rest of God. And then number six, it is by the scriptures that one encounters true prosperity. Shall we be upstanding on our feet? The only way we can profit, ladies and gentlemen, as a church as believers, as individuals, is by allowing the word of God to come alive in our hearts. There's a scripture that I believe all of us know. We memorize it from Sunday school in John chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, with, and the word was God. And then in verse 14, he says, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among men. That is the background of first John chapter 1 verse 1 where Paul I mean John is saying that we saw him we heard him we touched him the word of life he doesn't qualify Jesus as a man he qualifies him as the word of life why because for them it was not just an encounter with a man but an encounter with a life-giving spirit an encounter with a word that changed their lives saints if we are to become anything in life in fact, the earlier you do it, the better. The younger you are, the better. You can experience God in a way that nobody else has. I grew up admiring some of the most powerful, anointed men and women of God in my generation. I grew up admiring them. And I remember always telling God, I want to be like them. I want to I would mention names of men and women of God that are highly respected from all over the world. And I remember one time God saying to me, they have paid the price. You too must pay the price. You must have an encounter with me for that change to occur. Otherwise, you'll admire them for the rest of your life until you're walking with a stick and nothing has happened in your own life. I am not any different from you. I'm just you. But I have taken time to seek God and to desire Him and to love on Him and to walk with Him in a special dimension. And God has slowly been changing me and changing my life and giving me experiences that I cannot explain. That only God can do in my life. I have testimonies, thousands of them, about the goodness of God in my life. The grace of God in my life. But those testimonies are only good for me. I can share them with you, but they will just inspire you. They won't change you. You must desire Him for yourself. Paul in Acts chapter 20 verse 35 I believe he says I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up. It is the word of his grace that is able to build you up. May you get to a place where you encounter God, the word like this it becomes flesh. You read the scriptures, they come alive. 
that you scream and jump because you have encountered a message that will change your life that not even your father could make you experience. Amen. Hallelujah. One class I was sitting in, I was told that a gentleman was taking a birth in a bathtub and when he got in, I don't know what he discovered, a principle in physics, he got up and shouted what? Eureka. Now, if ordinary principles can mesmerize people until they shout and their lives are turned around because of a simple discovery of a natural law, how much more will we shout because of a discovery of a spiritual law? May you encounter God. Everybody lift up your hands and close your eyes. I pray that the word of his grace that is able to build you up will rest on you heavily. Not what I taught, but what God will extrapolate from the scriptures into your heart. In your spirit. In your spirit. It must come alive. It must be real. It must be something you experience. People will talk to me about speaking in tongues and, and, and how that felt. I admired them. Until the day I was in a primary school and we were praying and it was a Holy Ghost filling service and the Spirit of God came over me and I spoke in tongues for three hours and I cried like a small child. That experience I can never forget. So you don't need to teach me about the Holy Spirit because I know Him. I've experienced Him. That's why my life will be different. You don't need to worry about how I live my life. Don't worry, I know Jesus. I love Jesus. No, I'm not about to mess up. I love Him. I love Him. Have you encountered Him enough? Now I want you to, from the bottom of your heart and from the sincerity of your spirit, open your mouth and tell God, I want to encounter your word. I want to encounter your word. Everybody just open your mouth. Make it a personal prayer. It's a personal prayer. Lord, I want to profit by your word. I want my life to change by your word. I want my faith to rest on the power that is in your word. I want to enter into the rest of God that is found when I take your word by faith. I need this. I'm tired of religion. I want God. I want an authentic experience with him. I want an authentic experience with the word. Let him change me totally. That my marriage will be different. My life will be different. My young life will be different. My ambitions will be different. The way I do business will be different. The way I conduct myself will be different. My lifestyle, the things I say, the thoughts I have, the things I do, that it will be different different because I've encountered the word it will be different let it be different hmm. give us an encounter with your word change my heart oh God make it ever true Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Lift your voice and sing. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like And now we sing this and declare Be it unto me According to your word According to your promises I can stand secure Carve upon my heart The truth that sets me free According to your word, O oh God, be it unto. Sing it one more time, that's beautiful. Be it unto me, be it unto me. According to your word, according to your promises, 
according to your I can stand secure Cover upon my heart Cover upon my heart The truth that sets me free According to your word, O oh Lord Be it unto me Be it unto me Be it unto me According to your word According to your promises I can stand Cover upon my heart Set me free according to your word, according to your word. Oh, oh be it. Come on, just one more time. Lift your voice and say, Be it unto me, be it unto me. that much more meaningful is when you have a relationship with the author of this word you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to make that decision today if you lift up your hand we will spot it quickly we will help you we will lead you to Jesus is there anybody out there anybody out there that would like to give their life to Jesus hand your life over to Jesus and say Lord I want to have a relationship with you that my life will be different because the word that I read will have meaning because there will be a relationship therein lift up your hand wherever you are lift up your hand if you're here you'd like to give your life to Jesus today do not leave this place the same do not leave this place the same do not just go and read the word this is going to be words without a relationship but when you have a relationship with Jesus the author of that word it will come alive because you have a relationship if you're there and you want to give your life to Jesus lift up your hand we will pray with you give you just one more minute just one more minute if you're there just lift your hand or walk to the front whichever you find easier just lift up your hand and we'll pray together with you the rest of us just be in worship be in worship be in worship be in worship nothing will change unless you open your heart to the word of God If you'd like to make that decision, we are waiting just on you. It will take just a minute longer, just a minute longer if it will mean that we will find one more person that will join the kingdom.
away from all the noise of the word only according to your word away from the destruction of the world only according to your word away from every warped philosophy and human ideology only according to your word I am what your word says I am oh according to your word oh God Lift the name of Jesus. Celebrate the name of Jesus. 